So, um, look, hello everyone. Uh, um, it's fantastic that, that you could turn up here. I just want to make a few things clear before I start. I, I do want this to be quite informal. I'm not giving a presentation and I'm not an expert. We are very prepared to make sure that if there are particular areas that you want some uh, real expert advice in, then we will make sure we get those experts for future chats. We're hoping that these continue and, and we can make them a bit of a, a regular thing. So I'm, I'm not an expert, but I've been running arts organisations and working in the arts for a great many years, far too many years really. And so there's, there's a kind of a wealth of knowledge there and there's things that I think I can share. And I think that we've managed to steer Regional Arts WA pretty well through the, the beginnings of the, all of this crisis. And so I was just going to share today my kind of, the, the way we've maybe gone about it and some learnings that I've had, but I can also touch on some, some definite key things. I mean, I, I do know a fair bit about government relief and funding packages at the moment, and we can touch on those a little bit later. Uh, I'm pretty good on employment and contracts and some, some legal advice there. But I would always stress if I don't know anything or I'm not sure of something, don't follow my advice. And I'll make sure I say that if I don't think you should be. But we will definitely be taking down any particular questions you've got. And if I can't answer them today or I'm not comfortable answering them, we will make sure we get an answer for you. Either in a future one of these conversations because we think the topic's big enough or in a uh, just an email out to all the participants to say, look, we just wanted to follow up with this question. The other thing is that I would always point you in the first place to our, to our website. We've got a, a COVID-19 resources page, which, um, you know, we've got staff kind of working on that almost full time at the moment, trying to keep it up to date with all of the changing nature of things that are going on and also trying to unearth the very best resources that we can find. So, you know, very happy to, to be having this conversation and to you know try and help people with with questions where they have them and and some general pathways through COVID-19 um, and I hope that these can continue right so I'm just going to kick off here um, I, I guess with with anything like this with any kind of crisis um, that that occurs that I find that the best thing to do is to start with is to try not to be overwhelmed and by that, I mean, try and pick your, both your trusted sources of information and your trusted sources of decision making. And so you shouldn't feel as though you're out there on your own, trying to work your way through whatever's happening here, uh, whether you've got to be canceling events, whether you've got to be um, terminating contracts, letting people go, uh, make the decision to everyone work from home, all of those sorts of things, you shouldn't necessarily feel as though you're on your own. You should have some trusted sources of information and you should try and identify those as early as you can. And you probably already know what they are. For me, the trusted source of information are, are, are a couple of um, national organisations that, that we rely on for, for um, information and resources. So there's Regional Arts Australia, of which we're a member, there's the Australia Council, Live Performance Australia, for anyone involved in the performing arts. There's NAVA for the visual arts. And then in this particular case, because it's a health crisis, the, both the um, state and federal government health pages were really good sources of, of updates, especially in the early days when things were changing. Everything else, I treated as noise, because I don't know about you, but my emails in the first three or four days when all this was happening, my emails went up to just over a thousand a day. I was swamped. And the only way I could get through it was to make sure that I focused on my trusted sources of information and I kind of just disregarded all the rest because I just didn't have time. So it's, it's try not to get yourself swamped, try not to be overwhelmed. The second um, place then is around decision making. And for me, that means that I try and get a working group together, a smaller group of people who I can trust and rely on and who I can talk to about just about anything, to bounce ideas off, to get their feedback, to get their ideas. And I try and make sure that that's a mixture of staff. So for instance, here at Regional Art WA, 
we pretty well immediately set up a staff working group, which was just an opportunity for kind of four or five of us to get together and talk about the latest developments and try and go, how do we react to this? What do we do now? I then had a working party of the board, which happened to be the executive of the board, who I was then keeping in touch with on a kind of every second or third day, we would either have a meeting or an email quick exchange to let them know, um, you know, what was going on and to feed back to me around decision making that was happening. And then I also have some peers that I reached out to outside of the organization. So with those three sort of trusted sets of people who could make me help me make decisions, again, I wasn't feeling quite so alone. Um, you know, as the leader of an organization or as the chairperson of the organization, it can sometimes feel a little bit lonely when you're uh, responsible for making some of these decisions. I think the trick is in situations like this to make sure that you don't, that you're not alone, that you're not making these decisions on your own, that you're using trusted sources of information and then yeah, trusted ways of making decisions. So that was the first thing that I did, set up those sorts of processes to make sure I could navigate my way through the information that was coming at me and then have a way of making decisions that was both clear and fairly quick in the end because if, if you've got to go to a large group of people like a whole board it's going to take a lot longer an executive of the board where there's only three or four people there very quickly get back to you and go yes no need to think about this a bit longer i guess the second thing then is as quickly as possible try and get into a planning mode if you were anything like us you probably, when, when this all started to be unearthed and started to roll out and we all started to understand the full implications of what was happening, we were kind of very much in a reactive mode. We were very much taking a piece of information, getting a small group together going, how do we react to this? Let's do that. And so that was the kind of immediate response, if you like, um, in terms of, I guess, crisis management, where you really have to move as quickly as you can to try and stay ahead of things and you are simply reacting a lot of the time. What I would encourage you to do is as soon as you can move into a planning mode where you're actually sitting down and trying to manage what's going on rather than just reacting with what's going on. And the way that I did that and I guess the third step is that we fell back on key documents and processes or policies that we have as an organization. Now, some of the things I'm going to talk about, I would hope that most arts organizations and even individual artists have thought about at some point or another. Some of them may not have them in quite such detail or, or formalized documents as, as an organization such as ours. And if you haven't got those, I think what this crisis has done is kind of highlight the need for those things and to maybe, uh, you know, once we have a little bit of downtime is to start thinking about which of those we didn't have and how to move towards getting them. So I guess the, the, the three things that, that I really touched on um, particularly were, you know, we've got a strategic plan for a reason. As an organization, we've looked at what our core purpose is, why we exist and what it is we're trying to achieve, what our vision is. Now ours at the moment lasts for five years, but in fact, the core purpose probably extends well beyond that. In times of crisis, you can still rely on your core purpose and what your vision is that you're trying to do. So our core purpose is, a, core purpose is about celebrating and strengthening the power of regional arts. And our vision is to have creative and connected regional communities. So armed with those two things, you can kind of look at each part of your program and look at everything you're doing and every decision you're making and going, does it relate back to this? Are we reacting in a way that doesn't align with our core purpose, our key strategies and the vision that we're trying to do? So use your strategic plan is, is my big uh, takeaway from this, I guess. It, it is a roadmap for you. The road has now changed, but the map is still there and you should still be looking for the same sort of destination. You might just have to go around it a little bit of a different way. Uh, budget processes. So we've got 
kind of uh, a financial policy, obviously, and then we have a budget process where we present a budget to the board, it gets approved, we track that on a monthly basis and report back to the board, and every six months they get a revised budget because things have changed over a six month period. All we did was sh shorten that process completely. We just went, there are now budget implications here. Once we cancel an event, there are budget implications. We have to do a revised budget and we've got to get that back to the board as soon as we can to get approval so that we can continue to work knowing that we have the authority to, to make those decisions around that thing. So a kind of having, having a, a clean and um, uh, what's the word? Um, clean and not consolidated, uh, not concise. I forget what the word is. But having an organised process of how you manage your budget and how you're making financial decisions is really important for your staff and also for your board for their peace of mind. It's important for your staff to be able to know we're now doing something else and we're spending money in a different way. And it's important for the board to have peace of mind around some of the decisions they're making and the financial risks that might be inherent in that. And so the budget that I presented to the board within kind of a week of what was going on listed the key sorts of risks and gave them the key highlight changes that were happening so that we could move forward. And then the third kind of key document, and not everybody has these, but I would encourage you all to think about making sure you do, is the policy which is called variously well we call it the delegated uh, policy delegated authority policy where we know who's got the authority to change what so that you know we're an organization that is has the luxury of having more staff than, than probably most of you we then have so we have a management level we have the ceo management level then officer levels and we have to make sure we're very clear on who can make decisions around what, because it's all very well for me as the CEO to check with my board and go, we need to cancel this tour. It will have these risks. It will have these implications, both financially and in terms of programming. Are you okay with that? They say, yes. I then take that down to my managers and say, we're doing this and this. Officers then start talking to people in the region saying, we're doing this and this. They need to know how far they can go about making decisions on the fly because they're talking to people and people are asking questions. So we need to be very clear about that sort of process and who has the authority to talk about what and how much. So they were the three key things that I fell back on when we needed to make decisions and make changes to the sorts of programs that we were looking at. All right, thank you, Paul. What um, I was going to say, there's lots of dense material covered there. I thought it would give this opportunity for everyone to, to if you have any questions, um, perhaps just put your hand up at this and then we can have um, a quick question. I know there's quite a lot of dense information there. I guess I have a question when you're talking about that, Paul. Um, in terms of budgets, like I know that during the first two, three weeks of COVID-19, there was lots of different packages coming up um from the government how does that affect your budgets um look at, at the moment we are fairly confident that we will be able to access the um small business cash flow relief which was the um up to fifty thousand dollars by two so uh now we're not going to be able to access the full fifty thousand dollars or full hundred thousand dollars but we will be able to access some of that and that's to do with um, basically if if you pay tax if you pay payg tax um, then through the ato they are going to give you an amount equal to three months of what you if you pay in tax to employees and they're going to give you that as a cash flow probably i think by the end of april um, the other one is the JobKeeper, and I'll talk more about these later, but both of those packages in terms of that immediate federal government relief, I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to access, but I chose not to include it in the budget process because we don't have it yet. And I never ever give my board a budget that doesn't have absolute confirmed money in it. 
Otherwise, they're making decisions based on false assumptions. Sometimes I give them two budgets, one with the absolute known and one with some known and some potentials. But in reality, I didn't have time for that this time around. So all I did was say, here's the budget with all of the knowns and all of the changes that are happening. And here's a list of things where I think we're going to be able to access money because of all of the relief packages. But you, we won't know that until probably May. So my board will get another budget in May. Okay, I'll just keep going. Wave, wave at me if you want me to stop and explain something a bit more if you want something else. But, um, and so the way we then looked at um, what we were trying, the, the decisions we're trying to make is to break our program down into the, the individual activities or the individual projects that exist. And we went through each of them and went, okay, can we still deliver this in terms of contractual obligations? If the answer is yes, but we still need to vary something, then we talk to the funding body. If the answer is no, we need to think to ourselves, okay, can we repurpose this money? Because most of the funding bodies have been very good about offering flexibility around repurposing of grant money and or flexibility around timing of when things are delivered. And that includes us as a funding body. Um, so if you were a recipient of the Regional Arts Fund um, in the last round, you would have received an email and some communication from us saying, look, we understand you're not gonna be able to deliver something now the way you said you were. Talk to us about when you would like to do it or whether this change is what you can deliver. That's the message we were getting from most funding bodies. So you're looking at um, your earned income has kind of gone if you're cancelling events and things like that. So we were reduced just to the grants that we've received from people. And so we were looking at individual activities that were attached to particular grants that we had and had contractual obligations. Can you fulfill the contractual obligations, yes or no? If it's yes, fine, then you continue to go ahead. If it's no, can you repurpose them or are you just deferring those? In either case, you then have to kind of look at what might have already been spent or committed in terms of the money you've been given and be able to report that to the funding body and then be able to report exactly what is left and what you're proposing to do in terms of repurposing it. You're effectively doing another grant application almost, except it really is the detail doesn't have to be there as much. It is a, it is a kind of a two page thing that, that I've been sending to funding bodies saying, look, we can no longer deliver this. We've spent this amount of money on it already. We expect you will honor the fact that we've spent that on trying to do it. Here's an idea we've had for the rest of the money. This is how we would spend it. It's as simple as that. And I'm getting very positive response from most funding bodies when I do that. And they're kind of going, good, thanks, nice and simple and it's either a yes or a no. So there's a changed context around every single activity that we would have been doing. And the changed context obviously is mostly around the fact that we can't do regional travel and we can't bring people together. So what does that mean for each of those things? What does it mean to the shape of the activity? It was only after we looked at the shape of activity that we then moved on to what were the financial implications because for us, the project that we're delivering to the regional arts sector is the key to what we're doing, not necessarily what the financial implications are going to be. That to us is a secondary thing, just as important, but to start with, we wanted to look at the shape and context of the activities where we're trying to provide. Um, yes, what impact would these have on the sector? What impact would they have on our budget are the kind of things that we got to. Um, once we'd done that with our current activity program, we then went, okay, well, what else might be needed? And that's around the repurposing idea. So still keeping our core purpose and vision in mind, is there anything else that we can reassign money to? And I guess for us, one of the, um, one of the key decisions was around some of the touring that we do. Um, we've still got a big chunk of money because we couldn't deliver one of our biggest tours uh, in this from between February and June this year. And so we're now trying to talk to Lottery West about 
how can we use that money differently? Maybe keep some of it um, for a period of six to eight months to see what happens to the environment, to see whether a tour might still be possible towards the end of the year. But in reality, look at what the need from the sector is now, the most immediate need, and go, how best can we use that money? That money that we were given by Lottery West is not best used by sitting in our account for six months while we wait for this to be over, not knowing if it actually will be over in six months time. That money is best used in delivering something else to the sector, is our point of view to Lottery West, and we're hoping that they agree with that. And that might be that we start working on other projects and other activities that we'll be talking to the sector about, about whether they're relevant, whether they're gonna be accessible, whether they're gonna be useful, whether that's what you want, um, most immediately. We're going to start talking to everybody next week in a, in a process around that. And if we get enough of a consensus around things and we can get agreement from someone like Rotary West, the what else might be needed all of a sudden becomes an activity we can deliver through our, through our core activities. And then, you know, what other new options are there? The um, there's a lot of new funding programs being brought out. The Australia Council has its resilience package. Lottery West has just announced the 159 million uh, of new funding, not new funding, of um, realigned funding for them. I do believe that both the state government and the federal government, cross fingers, within the next four weeks, will be delivering packages just aimed at the arts sector. I don't think they're doing it at the moment. I think that both federal and state governments at the moment are trying to deliver relief and funding packages that are across the entire population rather than being sector um, specific and so hence JobKeeper. Um, but I do think that within the next four weeks, the conversations we're having, the advocacy that we're having at both the state and federal level is strongly suggesting that they will put packages together just for the art sector within the next three to four weeks. Whether that's too late or not for a lot of organizations and artists remains to be seen. We're trying to get them to work as fast as possible, but they're a government if they don't move fast. Um, where was I? So, so there are new options for funding. And the idea here is you don't just chase funding because the opportunity has presented itself. You are saying to yourself, what is my core purpose? What am I here to do? What is it that the sector needs? Can I do it with existing money and resources? No, I can't. Is it important enough for me to divert existing resources to putting in an application and to making doing all of that work to try and get the money? If the answer is yes, then that's what we do. At all times, we just keep asking ourselves, what is our core purpose? Do I say yes or no to this decision based on that? Um, and then the very last thing of this little kind of um, uh, response plan, if you like, was to communicate, to make sure that you'll communicate. Now, I, I believe in, in communicating as much as possible, but not overloading people, because I think it is far too easy in our digital age to get overloaded. And so, we try and stagger the communications that we do. And from my desk, the, the three areas that I have to look after are my staff, my board, and the sector. And so we try and make sure that there are levels of communication going out to all of those three areas on a very regular basis, um, and, but try not to overload anyone. Uh, um, so yes, communicate, but perhaps don't over communicate. Is, is the last part of my kind of, this is how we responded to COVID-19. We're now in the position where we are now trying to plan what it is we do between July to December, so that the regional arts sector is placed as well as it can to lead their communities out of COVID-19 in January. And what does that mean? That's a different framework. At the moment, we're working within the framework that says, okay, let's plan to make sure we alleviate the suffering and the issues that are going on with COVID-19 itself. We're now 
think that we've kind of got most of that planning in place. What we're now moving towards is using this same process to go, okay, what are we doing between July and December so that the sector is best placed in January to lead its community out of this um, crisis? Okay, I might pause because I need a glass of water. And I realize that I'm talking a lot and, and nobody's waving, so that's fine, I'll just keep talking. I can talk for days, um, although I think this does finish at, what's the time? It's one thirty. so I've still got half an hour. Uh, is there anything else that anyone wanted a bit more detail on there? Am I actually telling you things you already know and have done? Is this helpful at all? Do you need more detail? Yes. And thank you. Uh, am I off mute? You can hear me? Great. Um, okay, I'm just checking in because I've seen a flurry of email or messages from people around responses to the um, the federal government like putting in their job keeper stuff. So have regional arts put in a response around that in regards to sort of, you know, sole traders and artists and and the response to you know the Oz Coast stuff. So I know you've been doing some other kind of advocacy, but have you submitted something that's going to get to the meeting tomorrow? Yeah. So the the letter that went round, uh, I think it was late last week. So okay, take a step backwards. We're not in a position to be at the table in those meetings, mostly that are generated out of Canberra and Sydney, as without being a national body, we don't get a foot in that door. And so what we do is work with our national body, which is Regional Arts Australia, and make sure they're in those meetings. So whenever uh, the minister talks about, or the Australia Council talks about the peak bodies that they are talking to and meeting, uh, it was daily, it's now every second day, and it'll probably go down to weekly soon. But whenever they talk about those meetings, you can be assured that Regional Arts Australia is representing Regional Arts WA and by extension, the Regional Arts sector in those meetings. So the letter that um, went to the uh, Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister last week definitely addressed the notion of sole traders and how they were being missed out in, in the JobKeeper package. And so that information has been given very strongly to the minister in a meeting that I know happened yesterday. Um, and the minister is passing that sort of information onto the national cabinet, which is happening tomorrow. So no, I don't sit at those tables, um, but that sort of information, yes, has been advocated very strongly to, and so for instance, the, um, the reduction uh, for, for JobKeeper, um, an organisation had to prove that uh, they had a, suffered a 30% loss of income. And for some people in our sector, because our programs change so much on a year to year basis, it was actually very difficult to go, well, this time last year, we had the same pot of funding that we had this year, and we hadn't actually done any events. This time this year, we're exactly the same and we haven't, we can't prove that there's been a 30% downturn in those three months. We could probably prove that in the future, there's gonna be a 30% downturn by the time all our, our events get added together, but not so. And so we said, that doesn't work for our sector. And so they've reduced it to 15%. It's not perfect, but it's actually, so that that has been changed in the in the legislation that goes before parliament tomorrow. And so that sort of advocacy is happening on an ongoing basis, not necessarily from me. I'm more advocating at a state-based level, and I help and what I, and I do that through the chamber. So as a sector, over the last two or three years, we've all tried to come together, and we've all tried to say we are much stronger when there is one key voice talking to government. Yes, when there's a campaign. We need as many voices as possible, making as much noise as possible. But when we want one channel who represent us to talk to government, we should make sure that's the chamber. So I work with the chamber on that. 
I speak to the minister's office about regional arts in particular, but work with the chamber on the higher advocacy levels around what packages they might be putting together. Sorry, is that, uh, there's um, a question that here. So Jail's asking, is there any idea how we would prove reductions in annual turnover, given that we only submit annual activity statements? Um, look, uh, you, you may or may not have the capability of doing this, but all I did was go into our financial um, accounting package and I asked for a report for January to March from last year and a report from January to March for this year. Now, I'm lucky in that that clearly showed a 30% reduction and so, and so it would even pass 15% reduction stage. Um, if you can't do that and if it isn't as simple as that, I would argue that I, I don't think I don't know, it's, it hasn't come out on the tax department website yet, so we're kind of shooting in the dark a little bit, but it'll be self-assessment to start with. So if you say you've, you've um, undergone a 30% reduction, they're just gonna believe you to start with. Now you obviously then have to have something to back it up because in six months time, they may start doing some audits of some people. They won't audit everyone, they can't, but they will pick on some people and you might be unlucky. But all I would be doing is making sure that if you do think there is a 30% reduction, then just run the numbers. And I would go, okay, this is why there's a 30% reduction because last year we ran six events and they brought this amount of income in. This year, we can't run six events. And so there's that drop in income. And I would argue that that drop in earned income is as much the definition of a 30% reduction as it is from your global um, profit and loss statement and some reading of the Treasury documents suggests that as well but here's my first uh, um, condition the tax department hasn't released the full definition and the full papers around this yet and so anything I say here you take with a pinch of salt because the ATO could lay down a very strong definition that we all have to follow um, so when you say you only submit annual activity statements, you should be able to, depending on your financial software, if that's what you're using, you should be isolate, able to isolate a three month period. And initially that's what Treasury seems to be suggesting that we look at that three month period, January to March, 2019, compared to January to March, 2020. 15% for reduction for charities, will be confirmed in legislation tomorrow. So at the moment, none of this is confirmed because it hasn't gone through parliament. But the legislation that is going to parliament tomorrow has in it 15% for charities rather than 30%. Okay. Um, I, I guess the other thing that I, that um, I would- Ken had a question? Sorry, Ken had a question, I didn't uh, see that. Yeah. Paul, what's your understanding of how they're measuring uh, those amounts? In, I mean, it's being referred to as turnover. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a vast difference in the pattern between money coming in when you're, you're dealing with, with grant funding. It tends to come in in a very lumpy manner and the expenditure, of course, is, is in a very different sort of pattern. So do um, you know what they're actually looking at in that regard? No, and, and, and this is the problem when the ATO haven't ruled on it yet. So Treasury now, now use the term turnover that I've seen. Uh, they initially used the word income. And when it first came out in ministerial directives, it was coming out as sales. So a drop in sales revenue. So they, they're not quite sure yet. And in the end, we just have to wait for the tax department who are, who are running this. Uh, I did check yesterday afternoon. I haven't checked this morning whether it's up there or not yet. But um, I'm, what, what I would suggest is, and you may have already done this, is register on the ATO page. If you just put in ATO uh, JobKeeper, it will take you to the page where there's a big button that says, if you want to register 
to get more information about this, click here, and then they'll be sending you stuff as soon as they know. But yes, no, you're right. The terminology around this has gone through many filters and isn't quite clear. Um, sorry, and then the last thing though that I would say in terms of, of how we're trying to view this sort of thing as well is to, is, is to see it as an opportunity. You know, there, there's always opportunities, there's always a silver lining in, in every cloud. Um, and to see this as an opportunity in terms of, this, this becomes a good time if, if you can't actually deliver on some of the activities you were doing, this becomes a good time to start reviewing things like strategic planning processes. Was your risk management plan worthwhile if you had one? If you didn't have one, this might be a good framework and lens to start looking at a risk management plan of what you would do in times of crisis. Um, you know, this is a particular risk um, that we're going through here, and in reality, when I checked our risk management plan, and um, there are a couple of board members on the line here, so I just have to be careful what I say. But in reality, when I checked our risk management plan, there wasn't a lot in there that helped me with COVID-19. And that's the problem with risk management plans. You can't be there for everything. But this might, if you've got one, this might add another filter to how you use that plan and how you um, maybe revise that plan. Is your strategic plan helpful? I've said ours has been helpful, but we were in a, I think we were kind of lucky in a way. We'd spent a good 18 months as an organization because we hit a crisis two years ago where our key funding body pulled two of our programs that we thought were core to what we do. And when we turned around and said to them, but you can't do that, that's our core, that's what we do. They went, well, it's not what we think you do. Maybe you need to rethink what you do, which forced us into the bit. Now, we actually got those two programs back through another area, but it forced us into the position of going, well, who, who are we? What is it that we do? What is our core purpose? And we actually now have every single activity we do in our program is either called a core activity or an amplify activity. And so the first things to go in times like this are amplify activities because we focus on what is core. What would we do if there was only one person in this organization? What would we do if there was only one, a half person in this organization? What would we do if it was a volunteer run organization? Which means anyone can do this. You just have to work out what are the five or six things you do that are core to your reason for being. They're usually tied into the objectives in your constitution. Sometimes the constitution can be a little out of date, but they should be tied into those objectives as well. So we were lucky in that we'd gone through that very vigorously as a process over a 12 month period with a new board who brought fresh eyes to it. It was a really invigorating process for the whole organization and changed the way we look at how we work with the sector and the sorts of things that are important to us. We haven't been able to change everything yet because we've still got some contractual obligations that we're delivering on, but we are slowly moving. And this COVID-19 has been able to mean that for us, ironically, we've been able to go, that's where we want to be all the time. Let's go there now because we can't do these things anyway. So we've kind of pivoted and gone there now, but it's it, this, this period shouldn't be seen as a period of inactivity. You can actually repurpose what you're doing and also adapt what you're doing, but you can also use the time to review what it is that you've normally done. Um, and, and see whether your strategic plan has been helpful in this situation. If it hasn't been all that helpful, I'd suggest it's probably time to revise it and do it again. Are your financial processes flexible enough? Do you have those in place? Are they, are they helpful and, and helping out? And it's a good time to build skills, you know? Every man and their dog is now offering webinars. We're offering a webinar here, although we're hoping ours are a little bit different. We're hoping ours, start being maybe smaller groups and maybe more around conversations maybe we all maybe we recommend everyone watches a webinar on human resources for instance and then a week later we all get together in this sort of thing and people go 
I didn't really get that. I don't think that was relevant to me. I don't think they're talking about an organization our size. And we can tease out those sorts of things and work together as a group to build our skills. But now is a good time to be building skills. Okay. Um, should I maybe talk about employment and contracts? Does that help? Can I have hands up? How many of you um, employ people at your organization or whether you're a, a, an employed person? Yep, so about half probably, okay. Um, and so you, you probably will have been faced with whether, whether you are retaining, able to retain those people or whether you have to stand them down. Um, you know, the, the advice that I would have at the moment, the advice that I took from uh, Live Performance Australia, who have a special workplace advice team, uh, which goes well beyond just um, the performing arts. They'll give advice to anyone if you remember. And if you have a particular question, that you ask us and we can't answer it, that's the first place I'll go uh, because they've got a team of lawyers who will help us out. Uh, but their advice was to make sure that you don't just terminate contracts, that you stand people down. There is a special provision in the Fair Work Act now for standing people down under the circumstances of COVID-19. And that means that you can retain an employer-employee relationship without actually paying anyone or accruing any liabilities such as leave and things like that so that one those people can immediately go to center link to, to get money uh, now the federal government actually waived that anyway so that people don't have to prove um, that, that they were terminated or anything they just have to prove that they're in hardship and need work or two uh, now as it turns out the job keeper payments can be linked to people that you stood down rather than people you terminated. So anyone that you might have stood down, as long as they were in a contract with you as of the 1st of March, you can actually access money to help pay them through difficult times. Even if they don't do any work for you, I would encourage you to get back in touch with them and see what work you can get to do them for $1,500 a fortnight, but you know, that, that's up to you as an organization. So, um, the, the, the key document in all of this and in any employment contract is the Fair Work Act, which you, know, you can get through, uh, I think from our resources page. Um, they, they have a very clear outline of the minimum requirements you have to give as an employee. And they've been giving very good advice on how to deal with particular situations. And they give little case studies as well during this sort of time. So I would just encourage you to be going there. Um, I, I have had to readjust budgets so that I could try and retain as the, the staff that we have until many of our staff had contracts until the 30th of June. So I've tried to work out ways that I can honor those contracts to the 30th of June. Um, I'm, I'm lucky and we're in a privileged position. I know that I've been able to do that on mostly. We have stood one person down and I will be getting in touch with that person to make sure they can access um, JobKeeper now rather than having to go to JobSeeker through Centrelink. Um, but at the moment, we've been able to adjust budgets and things so that we are continuing to employ people that we had contracts with. But I, I very much understand that that's a privileged position and not one that many organizations can have at the moment. That, that's the only privilege of being a service organization. Normally, as a service organization, we're at the bottom of every pile. We're at the bottom of every funding pile. We're at the bottom of every advocacy pile. It just so happens that our money isn't so much tied to delivering projects. It's tied to delivering services to the, um, to the sector. And so not all of our programs are decimated by what's going on. Um, uh, I just seen a question here. So talking risk management, event cancellation insurance seems to me to be out of reach for many. Finding affordable insurance seems incredibly hard. Does anyone know an affordable option? Look, I don't have the answer there. Um, we, we have at times explored the notion of um, having group insurance policies. Um, there, there have been 
organisations who have offered this to members in the past. So whereby, you know, I guess what well, the case might be that Regional Arts WA takes out a giant blanket event cancellation policy that covers as much as we can. And it's either offered individually at a reduced price to everybody or everybody kicks into a large bucket and pays for the policy, which is exorbitant because it covers every single activity or event in WA. One by one, those group insurance schemes have kind of fallen by the wayside, either because they haven't worked, um, the insurance companies get out of something any way they can, or there hasn't been enough uptake on them when they have worked, or they've ended up being too expensive for people. So. We can look again at those sorts of things. It's, you know, I think the last time I did it was about probably three years ago, but I, I don't think they're a fantastic option. In terms of event cancellation, look, there is a really nice, um, simple English um, resource on our website from the uh, ACCC, which has um, information for small business on, on what to do around cancelling. I know this isn't cancellation insurance, but it does give some guidelines on what you need to be thinking about if you're cancelling something and your obligations, both legal and morally, when you're cancelling things. And it's those sorts of things that you need to think about the next time you're thinking about taking out event cancellation insurance. I don't have any magic bullets for insurance, I'm afraid. Um, I see them as the devil's work and um, hate them so you know I can't help there I don't know if anyone has had a good experience with any cancellation insurance that they had taken out and has now uh, is now being able to be accessed not seeing any hands so perhaps not um, we we didn't have cancellation insurance although we have quite a comprehensive um, business package, which as long as we put the correct clauses into our contracts that we have with people, allows us to access that insurance, but it's not specific can event cancellation insurance. Um, we, we prefer to do it in a more general way. And, you know, I could maybe talk about that at another time if, if that's of interest. Someone recommended duck for cover but, they, but uh, that person's never used it, so I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we could make a note of that and see whether they're, they're kind of reputable. I use Duck for Cover as an individual artist, and it's very affordable. Thanks, Joel. Uh, so that is maybe one that we can look into on your behalf and, and see whether it's, it's, um, it's worthwhile. Um, uh, there was one thing that I wanted to raise, um, so thank you for bringing up cancellations. The other one was I thought that it's interesting in that um, that ACCC document that they talk about membership. Now we made membership free about 18 months ago um, and uh, it's interesting because now the ACCC seem to be saying that if you're a membership based organisation and you've taken membership fees off people and you can't now deliver on your programme you should be considering giving membership fees back. Um, I'm quite sure that in our sector, if you were to talk to most of your members and say, you know, we're having trouble delivering this program, but we hope you're not looking to get take your membership fees back, that most, I would think that 99.9% .9 of people would, would say, yes, that's not a problem because I can't imagine you're charging exorbitant membership fees. But it is maybe one thing I hadn't thought of it. As, as something and it sort of popped out at me when I was reading that paper. Um, okay. Great. I'm uh, just going to quickly. We've got that. Oh, um, seven more minutes to go. Um, yep. I, I was maybe just going to talk quickly about some of the funding packages and things like that. I'm quite sure that most of you are aware of most of these, but just in case you're not, if I rattle something off and you don't know what it is, please get in touch or, or type something in the chat here and I'll see if I've got time to, to talk about it. But certainly the business cash flow assistance, that I think is just going to be automatically done by the ATO. So if you are doing PAYG with employees, 
that will just appear for you. And I believe everyone gets a minimum of $10,000 times two. So, you know, there, as long as you actually employ people, which is the sticking point um, for, for a lot of regional arts organizations, uh, but as long as you actually employ people, and of course it doesn't help individual artists, that there is some money coming in there. JobKeeper, we are hoping, and, and from reading a lot of it, um, you know, the, the, the key people who seem to be falling through the cracks now are casuals, um, as in perhaps an artist who has, you know, uh, contracts with three or four people, and some of them, you know, haven't been going for more than a year, and so um, they may find it difficult to access it. We will keep fighting on your behalf for that. Um, and obviously the 15% the hurdle is, is the key thing now. I'm hoping that with most people having to event, uh, having to cancel some sort of activities and events, that 15% is probably reachable by most of us as a barrier to that. And look, if you're having trouble working your way through this, once the ATO gives us the guidelines, I'm happy to, to help people talk their way through this. And if I can't help, we'll put you onto someone who can. Um, that doesn't kick in. It, it's, as, as you're probably aware, it's for people you had employed on your books from the 1st of March, but you don't actually get money until May. So um, if you choose to keep paying people, knowing you're going to get JobKeeper, you've got to look at your cash flows to see whether you can actually afford that. Um, there's an interesting one that um, is the second stimulus regional package. So this, this is the second federal stimulus that came out, uh, which was just before the JobKeeper package. And as part of that, Treasury alerted us to the fact that there will be support for affected regions. Now they haven't released what this is yet, and they say, according to a government release assistance, this measure will be available as soon as practicable. If we haven't got it yet, we don't know what that means. Um, we don't quite know what affected regions means, but it is something that we'll keep an eye on and make sure that we push out to sectors um, as we go. Uh, Peter Kimberley is asking, is it 15% for registered charities, but still 30% for NFPs that aren't registered charities? I don't know the answer to that. We'll take that on notice. Thanks. Um, so, you know, there might be a second stimulus package and then following on from that, as I say, we are hopeful and it is only a hope at the moment, but we are hopeful that within the next three to four weeks, the federal government will have a package simply for the arts sector. It won't be for the regional arts sector, it will be for the arts sector as a well. whole. Um, Lottery West obviously have their um, $159 million and you know they've got they've got event cancellation relief. And so I would urge you if if you're not able to repurpose whatever money you had or you were doing it in the hope that you would recoup enough money from the event itself to pay for costs, I would urge you to put in an application to them. I'm being told by them that it won't be an onerous application at all and it will be a very simple process so there is that and they also have what they're calling resilient arts sport events and community groups which are obviously going to be available to everybody yes Anne. um i thought that i had i saw something in one of those things from lottery west that said they're going to give that money straight to um a department arts wa whatever they're called these days dslg uh, one of the emails that I received that they said the 59 million was, so the 100 million was going to be for crisis packages and then 59 million was going to be for arts and then that was going to be handed over to um, Arts WA, DCA. Okay. Does anyone know about that at all? I haven't heard that detail exactly. I knew they've been working in collaboration and they're supposed to deliver this in tandem with each other because obviously the Department for the Arts isn't just the Department for the Arts, it's also the Department for Sport and Recreation. So this, so I know they're working together. I hadn't heard that there was a, a, a definitive carve up. So, uh, but that's a, another question we can ask Lottery West to see whether it's actually the department we'll be applying to. I think if it is, that that might be better. 
Um, then there's the Australia Council um, with their Resilience Fund. Again, I'd urge you, there's a link to that from our resources page if you, if you haven't looked at that. Um, again, Australia Council applications tend to be a little bit bigger than, than some others, but um, you know, it, it is a special amount of money that is for this time and this situation. So I'd urge you to go there. Um, uh, and then, uh, as I say, the state government, we are still talking to them and hoping that they will put something together that um, is rolled out um, just for the arts sector. We uh, thank are hoping that... Yep. Thank you, Paul. Um, Unfortunately, at this time, we have one, uh, one, maybe one more question. I have got Kimberly, Kimberly Theatel raising the hand. So, did you want to have your question? This could be the last question of the session. Did you yeah, thank you. It's Jail here. Um, Paul, sorry, I want to just go back to the Laurie West stuff for a sec. Is there any indication as to when those details will be released? I keep checking every day, and it just says more details available soon. Any idea when? No, uh, the conversations I've had, nobody's been able to tell me, Chael, so I'm afraid it is just a matter of, we'll, we'll put it up on our resources page as soon as it's there, but uh, you know, it, at the moment it is just a matter of checking daily with a lot of these things, unfortunately. Thank you. Right. Um, did you want to finish up there, Paul, or are you finished? I'm, I'm finished. You just stop me mid sentence and I'm finished. Wink. See, Great. that's how it works. <laughs> Perfect timing. Um, again, thank you for everyone for joining us today. Uh, before you go, we'd we'll love to keep these sessions regular. So, if there's anything you want to know more about from an artist point of view or organization point of view, please pop it in the comment section before you leave and we will endeavor to try to answer these questions in ongoing weeks and months during this um, COVID 19 um, situation. Yeah. Yeah, I, I talk too much, basically, but I, I was supposed to get on to the point where I say, OK, well, what is it that you guys want from sessions like this? So please don't hesitate to tell us. We, are, as I say, we're repurposing staff and some resources to be able to deliver much more of what it is you need. But you've got to tell us. Otherwise, we start delivering things into a vacuum. So please yeah. let us know if there's something in particular that you want to know about, either most of my staff have been charged with trying to reach out to you know two people in the sector or so just about every day to try and have a telephone conversation they'll be asking the same thing but this is an opportunity just to tell us um if you want to text it into the chat there yeah and if thank you, you very have, much for listening and if you haven't thought of anything now you can always always email us at um, info at regionalartswa.org.au with your queries and questions as well Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Paul. See you, gang. Stay safe.